Okay, so this is part three. We're going to talk about Senate Bill 8 and the status of the litigation. So I'm going to start off with the Supreme Court, which has basically what the news says is that the Supreme Court struck or did refuse to strike down the Texas law. But let's go into greater detail about what actually happened. So I've already discussed the text of Senate Bill 8 in the previous video. But basically, the case is now a whole bunch of abortion clinics. So Whole Women's Health, Alamo Reproductive Services, a bunch of doctors against Judge Austin Reeve Jackson, Penny Clarkston, Mark Lee Dixon, a bunch of guys. One of the two important parties in this case, the two important defendants are the Judge Jackson and a guy named Mark Dixon. And this is a 375-page legal argument that was filed before the Supreme Court uh, last week. And it's basically asking the Supreme Court that we have an emergency and we want you and technically to pause this Texas law. But how we got to this point was that you can't just file suit in the Supreme Court. What happened was the, the plaintiffs here said that if this Texas law is to be enforced, then our, we're going to suffer irreparable harm. Because basically, if we perform abortions, in Texas, people are going to sue us, random people. So they actually filed suit in a district court, and the district court had some delays, and then the case moved to the circuit court, and there were more delays there, and then the plaintiffs decided that they were going to run out of time. And so they just wanted an emergency stay or an emergency injunction to be issued by the Supreme Court pending further litigation. And so we're not going to just read this whole thing because it's quite long. But basically, this goes back to Roe v. Wade, where the court had said that abortion was legal. and And we're not going to repeat the bill, but basically the bill does not allow a physician to perform an abortion if he detects a heartbeat. And there's a heartbeat at six weeks, not really a heartbeat, because there's no real, the heart hasn't really formed yet, but there's, you know, an electrical activity in the area where the heart's going to be. And at six weeks, a lot of women don't know that they're pregnant. Uh, it's close to 85% according to uh, a lot of documents. So basically, nobody wants to perform an abortion. They're going to get sued for it. So they're going to have to close down. And so on July 13, the plaintiffs sued the um, basically, they couldn't sue the Texas legislature, and they couldn't sue the attorney general because the way this bill was crafted, it prohibits the state from enforcing it. It only allows the private citizens of Texas to enforce the act. And that's kind of messed up. So you can't sue 
all the citizens of Texas and attempt to obtain an injunction against them. So they figured we could sue um, all the judges in Texas because the judges now have to enforce the act. And so rather than suing all the judges, they sued Judge Austin Reeve Jackson. They picked one judge and Penny Clarkston, a court clerk. So they sued one court clerk and then their plan is to create what we call a class action so to say that this state judge represents all the judges in texas and this court clerk represents all the court clerks in texas and then they also sued mark lee dixon who they say is probably going to file lawsuits against people who perform abortions. And who is he? Well, he's a loudmouth from Texas. He's uh, a pastor of the Sovereign Love Church, and he's also a director of a pro-life organization. So that's why he's named of course, he may not necessarily be filing suit against any specific person, and it's not. There's no no abortion has technically taken place that he could sue over, but they're trying to get basically what we call prior restraint. So they're trying to get an injunction that prohibits him from suing anybody are over an abortion under this law. And so this so law took effect September 1st. So in July, about seven weeks before that, they filed what they call a motion for summary judgment, which basically means they asked the district court, they sued for an injunction and they asked the district court to grant them a judgment without holding a civil trial. Basically saying our case is so strong that there's no, the facts aren't in dispute here and you should just rule on the, uh, on the record here. And one of the things that they said was that they would basically have to shut down their abortion clinics. And uh, that's a irreparable harm. And so uh, the government, everybody, including the state judge, argued that they were entitled to sovereign immunity. But basically, that they were immune to any lawsuit. Um, Generally speaking, a state and federal governments and foreign governments are have the sovereign immunity. They can't be sued for official acts. Um, I don't think this is such a case, but that's something that hasn't been decided by the court yet. And then their other argument is that they lack standing. So uh, basically, that since there hasn't been, since no plaintiff has performed an abortion that could get them sued, and since no plaintiff has been sued, then in fact, no plaintiff has been injured. So uh, basically, the government's arguing that the plaintiffs are filing a lawsuit based on speculation when no harm has been done to them yet. And after that, the clerk of the court and the um, Dixon guy both filed what we call a writ of mandamus, which is um, asking the court to basically file an order. And the order was asking 
a court to dismiss the case against the judge and the court clerk due to sovereign immunity. And the district court said that he was going to rule on the jurisdictional defenses first to see whether he whether this case could even be heard in his court. And the Court of Appeals denied the petition, saying basically that they weren't going to step in and order the district court, the lower court, to dismiss the case. They wanted the district court to run the case its way first and then decide. And then there was a hearing. And at the hearing, the district court refused to give the judge and the clerk sovereign immunity. And so he refused to dismiss the case. And so they went back and appealed to the circuit court saying this case should be dismissed. And also that they wanted the district court to basically pause its hearing, its, its proceedings until they had a chance to hear from the circuit court because the plaintiffs were asking the court to give them a preliminary injunction saying, you know, if you don't pause this Texas law, if you don't order this law, you know, to stop, we're going to suffer irreparable harm. What we're asking is for the court to give us an injunction and say there's irreparable harm and then this law should not be enforced pending the full outcome of this court case. We call it a preliminary injunction. So for example, if I have a tree and I want to cut down the tree and you're suing me to stop me from cutting down the tree, even if you're not likely, even if it's not guaranteed that you're going to win, you would get a preliminary injunction saying stop him from cutting down the tree pending a full resolution of the case. Because if I cut down the tree now and you win, there's no bringing the tree back. So the same with this abortion case. If if the law is enforced and all these abortion clinics shut down and then later it turns out that they were right and they win and the law is struck down, they've already shut down and they're not coming back. So that's why they need to have a preliminary injunction. And the Court of Appeals basically said that that they would put a temporary stay of the district court hearing. So they ordered the district court to not proceed with the case, including a hearing for a preliminary injunction. So basically, now the case is with the circuit court and the district court can't pause, can't can't pause that abortion law. And so the plaintiffs asked for, um, they wanted to have a faster appeal, but they were running out of time because now it's uh, August thirty first or August twenty nine or whatever, and. And this law is going to take effect in a couple of days. So they said to the circuit court, hey, if you're not going to let the district court issue the injunction, then you issue the injunction. And the court said no. And so they ran out of options. And that's why 
they're suing for that's why they've attempted to obtain an emergency hearing in a Supreme Court. And so their argument was, first of all, that an injunction was necessary to maintain legal rights and prevent irreparable harm. And injunctions can be issued under their four circumstances. First one is that the applicant's likely to win in the actual court case. The second is that they would have irreparable harm if they did not get the injunction. And the third is that uh, the injunction will not be harmful to the public interest. So all of these things are valid and Then their argument is that also that Senate Bill 8 is unconstitutional because the Supreme Court has already ruled many, many times that a abortion at an early stage is permitted. And and also that in many cases the state of Texas has said that the ban would not be constitutional under Supreme Court law. I mean, Supreme Court, previous Supreme Court decisions. And they cite many different cases where this is the case. And then they also argue that the judge and the clerk who are being sued are really uh, the defendants here because there's no other because they're the ones responsible for enforcing the future lawsuits and then part b says that there's exigent circumstances that require the relief because starting september 1st when this law takes effect um the the, the plaintiffs are going to suffer irreparable harm and that there's no other way to prevent it and the irreparable harm is that they're going to have to either shut down their abortion clinic or get sued and that means that a lot of people will not be able to obtain abortions and it's not like they can put the baby back in and the injunctive relief is proper, so this is just generally that uh, their argument is that they can obtain an injunction against a Texas judge because, um, and what they're looking at here is that 42 United States Code um, 1983 permits injunction against a judicial officer in an official capacity. But there is a limitation. And so now the argument is that uh, the clerk of the court being sued is just a um, court employee, not necessarily a judicial officer as defined by the act. And then saying, well, if the Supreme Court can't grant the injunction, then the Supreme Court should at least um, vacate the stay placed by the appeals court so that the district court can hold the hearing on the injunction. Because right now, the circuit court told the district court, you can't do anything until we have our hearing. And again, um, making the same argument that lifting the stay is appropriate because of the irreparable harm and also 
that the circuit court should not have been allowed to um, stay the district court's case. That the circuit court made a mistake, basically. And then obviously that the Supreme Court is most likely going to hear this whole case at some point after it's gone through the district court and the circuit court. And then if the court doesn't want to issue an injunction and doesn't want to lift the stay, then at least the Supreme Court should vacate the district court's order to deny the motion to dismiss and let the district court go through its decisions again to um, think about whether the judge and clerk can be um, treated as a class. And then we have our conclusion. And then if we go through, they've attached the Court of Appeals decision. So as you can see, the Court of Appeals previously ruled that the motion for an injunction is denied. And the motion to vacate the stay of the district court is denied. And the motion to vacate the order denying the motion to dismiss the appeal is also denied. And then this is the original order that the district court proceedings are stayed until further order of the court and they're giving Mark Dixon time to file a reply to their motion to dismiss his appeal. And they've got until whenever. And here's basically people being sued have asked the court to put a pause on the case because they're appealing the court's order. So the district court, so the plaintiffs sue the defendants in the district court. And the district court. So I'm going to hear this case. And then the defendant said, well, we want you to throw this case out, dismiss it. And the court said no. So they filed an appeal. So then the, then the plaintiff said, well, we want a preliminary injunction. We want you to prevent enforcement of this law until the case is resolved. And the court said, okay, we're going to have a hearing on that, decide whether you get your injunction or not. And then the defendant said, well, hold on a minute. We want to appeal the motion to dismiss. We want to appeal the denial of the motion to dismiss. And then the court Appeals court said, okay, we'll hear your appeal. And then they said, while you hear our appeal, we want you to pause whatever the district court is doing and not let the district court decide on the injunction. So I can draw this out if I wanted to. Um, so. It kind of worked like this. Here's where we are. We got basically um, abortion clinics. Versus. Versus uh, the judges of Texas 
clerk of the court of taxes pro life die so this whole thing is a lawsuit in federal district court and then these guys say dismiss because we have sovereign immunity and the court says no so then they say so then the plaintiffs say, we want preliminary injunction. Basically, pause SB8. And the court says, let's have a hearing to discuss. Meanwhile, these guys say, well, the court won't throw the case out. I'm going to go to appeals court. So circuit court, appeal the denial of dismissal. And the court says, okay, we'll hear your case. And then they say, great. So also pause the hearing. So don't, don't give them the injunction until, until we decide. So then the plaintiff said, okay, well, we're going to go to the Supreme Court of the United States emergency, either, either on posit, and they said no, or Give us the injunction. Pause SB8 yourself. And they said no. Or make the district court get back to work. And they also said no. So now this has to just run its course in the circuit court. There is no other way. So now we're back on here uh, with the argument that basically the defendant Mark Lee Dixon is not entitled to sovereign immunity and only the judges. And so the judge said the defendant's motion to stay the case is granted in part and denied in part and that the Dixon guy cannot have a state but the state can basically the judge can and then we had this other decision with some other random people who also wanted to not be sued And we're just going to scroll through because largely repeats the same arguments. And so um, the judge also denied them. So they're not 
So they tried to get their case dismissed too, and they said no. And then Circuit Court of Appeals uh, had a writ of mandamus. So they were asking the district court rule on a motion to dismiss. And so this was the original order that was denied. And then this is a copy of the bill that is just attached to the court filing, which we've already gone through in the previous video. And then Allison Gilbert, who, uh, so remember, they asked for summary judgment. Uh, I didn't mention that in the drawing. Basically, they're saying that this case is so open and shut that the court shouldn't even hear from the other side. They should just, it shouldn't have a trial. It should just rule on the facts. And in support of that, she's provided a sworn statement saying that she is a director of, you know, the surgery center. And she's a doctor and she is an expert. And that she, her clinic does 9,000 abortions a year. And she personally does 3,000 abortions a year. And that there's very limited exceptions to SB8. And SB8, um, its definitions are not really accurate. And so... Uh, that there's cardiac activity after six weeks, but at six weeks, the baby's just a, basically a water balloon. So, so the act is really just stupid. Because basically, you're just taking out a water balloon that's got some kind of electrical signal. It's not a heartbeat. And a lot of people don't, even realize they're pregnant at that point. So, so this is going to be a huge disaster to people in Texas. And it's not like the abortions are dangerous, you know, only 1% have a complication and it's much safer to have an abortion than to have a childbirth. Uh, it is 14 times more dangerous to have a pregnancy carried to term. And there's a lot of reasons why women need abortions. And there's really no exceptions to this bill. And this thing is going to be a disaster to the people who perform abortions. So for example, for her, she's basically going to be out of a job. And so will all the people who work with her. And they'll all be subject to lawsuits, like ridiculous lawsuits. And her health clinic will also um, basically have to shut down. And then here's a copy of her CV. And then we've got other doctors who also have sworn statements basically attesting to the same thing, how this law makes no sense medically and how it's going to hurt people. Um, we've got another person asking for summary judgment. Um, she's a corporate vice president of the company, so more of a financial perspective here. Uh, administrator. So yeah, we basically got uh, a bunch of sworn statements from people telling the judge that this bill should just be thrown out. And we don't even need to go to trial. And then got some other evidence they've introduced. One of them is from Mark Lee Dixon, who is the guy being sued as one of the representative defendants. And he's the one 
saying that he is going to be suing them for the abortions um, as soon as the law takes effect. And he's planned some kind of rally. And he's actually filed, or there's a lawsuit between here between Planned Parenthood and the city of Lubbock, Texas. And there's a transcript of the case here that was filed. And then more sworn statements from different people. And then here's a um, uh, a letter from one of the uh, pro-life organizations saying that if you know about any abortions, let us know. So, and yeah, so there's a lot of doctors here who have effectively testified about the irreparable harm of the case. And one of them, for example, is talking about, um, well, uh, about an infiltration of an anti-abortion activist at her clinic. I'm not going to read through all of these because they are largely uh, covering the same ground but from different people with different perspectives. And then we even got one from the church. And then the district court, this was a letter that the district court wrote to the circuit court saying that it didn't accept the writ of mandamus because it was going to hear its own, it's going to make its own decisions. And then this was a response from North Dixon, who is a defendant, one of the defendants in the lawsuits. And he's saying, I have no intention of suing any of the plaintiffs because I expect each of the plaintiffs to comply with the act when it takes effect and I expect the mere threat of civil lawsuits will be enough to induce compliance. Um, and then he mentioned that in Lubbock, Planned Parenthood stopped performing abortions in June when, when the city banned abortions rather than um, risk any lawsuits or criminal prosecution and that he personally never threatened to sue any of the plaintiffs in the lawsuit nor has he intended to sue them and and so his argument is I'm not going to sue them because I expect them to comply with the law. But there are arguments that we don't want to comply with the law. The law is really bad. Uh, we have to comply with it because we're going to be sued if we don't. It's kind of a catch-22. And then here's another guy who's also suing, who's also being sued, and he's saying he's not planning to sue them. And then we've got some, we've got so like a statement from the judge who's being sued, and he was at the legislature apparently.
And here's one of the senators who voted to pass the bill. And some tweets from the defendant saying that he's proud of this bill, basically. And some uh, posts from his uh, Facebook page. So all this was filed as evidence. So yeah, the rest of this is just affidavits and uh, internet clippings that were filed in the district court um, showing that the defendants plan on litigating if they uh, if this bill is to take effect. And then after all this was filed in the Supreme Court, the defendants filed their opposition. So they filed a 95-page brief, and they basically summarized the case and their argument for why the Supreme Court should not stop this case is A, that the plaintiffs don't have standing. So... The only way that you can sue somebody is if that person, uh, if you are injured from the unlawful act of the defendant. So, in this case, they're arguing that the abortion clinics can't sue a judge and this other guy based on the fact that a law out there allows the other guy to file a lawsuit against them later. In other words, you can only sue somebody if that person has caused you an injury in the legal sense. You can't sue, even if you are to argue that if you perform an abortion, some random people are going to come sue you. You can't file a lawsuit against them to stop them from suing you. They haven't done it yet. And that's where it gets tricky. Because it's almost like you have to file a lawsuit against nobody. And how do you file a lawsuit against nobody if a person you're suing has to have a chance to respond to the lawsuit? It's a, it's a very unique circumstance here. And then... So their argument is, A, they, they can't sue a state judge or a state court clerk and try to get an injunction to stop them from enforcing a lawsuit that a, another private citizen in Texas might file. And there's no, the principles do not allow you to sue a state court judge to prevent him from enforcing a law that just shouldn't be allowed because in other words a judge doesn't have um, any skin in the game so the judge doesn't care in theory one way or the other how a case before him is resolved. He's supposed to be impartial. So you shouldn't be allowed to sue the judge on the basis that he's going to apply the law, apply a law that's unconstitutional. And and so let the judge do it his way, basically. So if they feel like the judge is going to enforce a law that's unconstitutional, they should, instead of going through the Supreme Court, they should appeal his decision through the state 
appeals courts and then bring that case to the Supreme Court if they have to. And then in this case, the district court is saying that the judges are should be sued because they're the only members connected with the enforcement of the Senate Bill 8. And they're basing it, the district court based its decision on a case called Chubby versus Kramer. Um, but uh, defense says that the district court misinterpreted that case. And their argument is that case only said that uh, state action applied for the purposes of the 14th Amendment. And that it only applies in a very specific case, not this case. And then their other argument is that the plaintiffs can't sue the state because the state isn't allowed to enforce the act. And that's pretty clear in the act that the state can't enforce the act. So how can you sue the state? for something that they have nothing to do with. But of course, they have nothing to do with it because it was written in, in that sense. So hopefully somebody in the court will say, well, there should be, you know, you can't, there has to be some, the law has to be practical. So you can't just write, you can't create a, a law that can't be appealed, basically. And then uh, they're trying to argue that the sovereign immunity is valid against the judge and the clerk. And against the state. And then they're also arguing that Section 1983 of 42 United States Code says that we can't obtain an injunction against the judge or the court clerk. Um, and there's a specific law that says in any action brought against a judicial officer, injunctive relief shall not be granted unless a declaratory decree was violated. So their argument is that they could not obtain declaratory relief because there's an emergency. And they're also arguing that Mrs. Clarkson, who's a court clerk, is not a judicial officer. And then they're also arguing that the plaintiffs have not shown irreparable harm. Basically, the abortion clinics are saying that if this law goes forward, we're going to be sued and we're going to shut down and we won't be able to reopen. And the defense is saying that this is all speculation because there's no proof of that. And even if we stop, um, even if we obtain an injunction, against the judges and the clerks, uh, the plaintiffs are still going to be injured. So, because even if you sued a bunch of people and gotten injunctions from them, there's still a whole bunch of other people who can sue you. Because they're asking for the state to not collaterally enforce Senate Bill 8, they're asking for this one judge to not hear lawsuits. They're asking for this one clerk to not docket lawsuits. And they're asking for this one guy to not sue them. But other people can sue them and other courts can still hear the lawsuits. Of course, that's not really what they're asking for. Uh, that's kind of a misinterpretation. Uh, what they're actually asking for is um, for every 
body to not be able to sue them or enforce this case. And they're trying to create what they call a class. So they're trying to get the court to issue, you know, I mean, ideally a blanket injunction saying that this law cannot be enforced. And they're arguing also that the prejudice that's taking place was created by the plaintiffs and that this act has been discussed since basically the beginning of this year and it was sent to the governor on May 14. And so they had, you know, months and months to to do something about it, but they didn't actually ask for the preliminary injunction until basically one month before the act took effect. So had they started litigation much earlier, uh, at this point they would uh, be in a much better position legally, but they waited until they only had a month left. And so they shouldn't be claiming irreparable harm uh, for something that they personally could have prevented. And they're also asking for an uh, overbroad injunction. So they're asking for um, an injunction that completely prohibits enforcement of the entire act, but there's portions of the act that they claim are not going to harm them. So, for example, one portion of the act says that a doctor has to perform a check for a heartbeat before performing the abortion. And that is not providing a repairable harm onto the plaintiffs. And they also um, are not clear about what should happen um, in court. So they're saying basically we should have an injunction preventing the judge and the clerk from enforcing or processing or filing lawsuits related to this bill. But they're not actually saying uh, there's no plan for what these Texas courts are supposed to do. If somebody does try to file the bill. And then they're saying that they, the defendants, are actually the ones who are irreparably harmed if there's an injunction. And they're saying this because the state is being prohibited from effecting uh, a law that it's that was passed. So basically the Supreme, they don't want the Supreme Court to give an injunction onto the state that can basically stop the government from passing a law. And so they cite O'Shea versus Littleton, um, where somebody sued a state asking for a federal audit of the state criminal proceedings and the court had said no in that case. So they're saying basically uh, an injunction would effectively shut down the checks and balances where basically taking away rights that were given to the state by the constitution. So that would be inappropriate for a federal court to intervene in the functions of a state court. And now they're also saying that since ethically speaking, a Texas judge should not publicly comment about a public, about a case that may come before his court. And that of course exempts the judge who is being sued in his personal capacity. But how can the judge stop commenting on the case if he's being sued in the case? 
And so if the judge decides not to fight back in this case, then what's he going to do when, or if he, if he starts to fight back, he's no longer going to appear neutral in the case. So what's he going to do if one of these cases ends up before him? And then the other argument is that the court should not vacate the district court stay because the, the defendants have a right to hear to a hearing in the circuit court. And they should not vacate the denial of the respondent's motion to dismiss. So So they're asking basically Supreme Court to order the appeal to be moot and send the case back to the district court so that it can hold a hearing on the preliminary injunction. And they're also saying that's not appropriate because the circuit court should not does not have authority to vacate a ruling in the lower court. It can only make a decision and send that decision to the lower court and ask the lower court to uh, to basically remand the case for further action consistent with the ruling. And that concludes the uh, appeal and then basically there's a whole bunch of attachments which are the original lawsuit that was filed in this case for relief and then saw an affidavit from the Supreme Court. And then the plaintiffs responded with a 49 page brief basically saying we don't agree. I won't really get into details. And then there was one more reply, which was 22 pages, and effectively saying, you know, that, that we disagree with your disagreement. And then finally, the Supreme Court ruled on this. So originally, this was sent to Justice Alito because he's responsible for the Texas district. And so the Supreme Court basically said, in order to get the injunction, you must have a very strong showing that you will succeed in the actual case and also that you will be irreparably injured without the stay. And that the stay is consistent with the public interest and that the balance of equities favors the stay. And then they said, well, there's quite a serious question because uh, the constitutionality of the Texas law is at issue, but these, there's quite complicated procedural questions. And one of them is that the federal court has the right to enforce injunctions against people who enforce laws, but the court can't actually delete the law itself. And so a real question is, are the people who you're suing correct? Because it's not clear that they're the ones who are going to actually enforce this law. And if that's the case, then why should the court be allowed to issue an injunction against them? The only way you can get an injunction against somebody is 
if that person has threatened to injure you, has actually injured you or is threatening to injure you in a way that's pending, that's, that, that is certain. And so the state says that it's not going to be enforcing this law directly or indirectly because the state wrote in the law that it's not allowed to enforce it. And the courts, the Texas courts, the state judges, um, it's also not clear if the Supreme Court can order a state judge to not hear a lawsuit for a case that's unconstitutional. And the Mark guy, the only guy who's um, being sued in a, his personal capacity as a private citizen, uh, filed an affidavit saying that he's currently not intending to in file any civil actions. Of course, what he actually said is, I don't expect to file any civil actions because I expect the plaintiffs to follow the law. And then, so based on that, uh, they're saying that uh, there's the burden of proof to file an injunction is not met. And also, we're just, the Supreme Court is saying we're not ruling on the constitutionality of this law, and we're not trying to resolve any claim in the application or in the lawsuit. We're just saying that maybe you've sued the wrong people, or we're not sure who you're supposed to sue. But in other words, they're saying, you know, that the scheme that Texas came up with actually worked. Because you wrote this law, and now its constitutionality can't be challenged because there's nobody who can challenge it. There's nobody who you can sue uh, to stop its enforcement. And then um, that's it, basically. Now, John Roberts and Breyer and Kagan dissented, saying there's five to four. So they said that we should have at least a preliminary relief to preserve the status quo so that we can consider whether a state can avoid responsibility for writing such a law. Because uh, they're saying basically the way that it was written may preclude judicial intervention, but even though that's the case, there's still, there's got to be some benefit to consideration by the courts. And uh, Supreme Courts uh, being asked to, uh, to answer a question of law that's extremely new and to do so without any legal briefs or a hearing, basically just come up with an answer on paper without speaking to the parties, which is not typical at all. And so the court says that, so they, even though they disagree with the, with the majority opinion here, they're saying that they understand the court is saying that it's not um, calling the law constitutional and that they should have another hearing later. And then, of course, Breyer, Sotomayor, and Kagan wrote their own opinion, which largely said the same thing. Um, that basically the state cannot delegate the veto power. The state should not be able to regulate abortion during the first trimester. And that's a previous hearing, but now they're saying that basically this new law does just that. And even though the law 
delegates enforcement to people like private citizens and even though the state did that uh, the justice is saying that that is still invading the constitutional right and it should not make a difference in the enforcement because where a legal right is invaded there should be a remedy so it doesn't matter whether the state is enforcing it or whether a private citizen is enforcing it there has to be a way to remedy the law and so the court should not allow this to take effect and then Salto Mayor wrote her own case saying that this is pretty much saying that the majority opinion is basically insane because how how can the kid how can the court ignore a obviously unconstitutional law that was sneaky and designed basically just to screw with people and the justices buried their heads in the sand and even though there's been 50 years of federal precedent and then the court says well we don't want to grant relief because the case is complicated but even though the case is complicated on its face it's pretty obvious that it's unconstitutional and there's it's going to affect 85 percent of abortion patients and if the act is unconstitutional then it should be enjoined it doesn't matter what the mechanism and no prohibition has ever been upheld by any federal appeals court and the fact that the legislature knew that and tried to circumvent it by uh, making it enforceable privately should be in its own a, a reason enough to uh, obtain an injunction on this act. And so taken together, the act is a breathtaking act of defiance of the constitution of this court and of the rights of women. And the uh, Fifth Circuit abruptly stayed all proceedings and the applicants requested emergency relief, but this court said nothing. And today the court finally tells the nation that it declined to act because in short the state's gambit worked and the structure of the scheme raises complex procedural questions. This cannot be the case that a state can evade federal scrutiny by outsourcing the enforcement of unconstitutional laws to its citizens. And Kagan wrote her own opinion. And it's even more scathing than Sotomayor's to talk about how the court has a shadow docket uh, that departs from the usual principles of appellate process and the majority acted without any guidance from the Court of Appeals and barely bothers to explain its conclusion and uh, how the shadow docket decision making every day becomes more unreasoned, inconsistent, and impossible to defend. So I think a couple of the justices are pissed off, to say the least. Um, yeah, and that concludes our coverage of the um, current litigation before for, for Senate Bill 8. And uh, look forward to part four at some point in the future.